how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, just got out rototilling my weed garden. Um, but yeah, a good crop of weeds this year. Well, Jesus loves weeds, did you know? <laughs> well, that's what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Weeds and tears are not to pull them out, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. Love your enemies, Liz. Yeah, weeds I, I, are kind of hard to do. Yeah, I talked uh, about how Jesus isn't a good gardener. Um, <laughs> but but it's all right, because he's not a gardener or a fisherman or a carpenter. He's a messiah, so. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, well, today we're going to talk about uh, title pending, but we'll see how our discussion goes. But basically, what does the Bible say is uh, to be valued most, or what does the Bible say about treasure uh, has a nice ring to it. So we'll, we'll see what we come up with. But um, uh, kind of continuing a, a little mini series, we were interrupted last week by VBS for you, and we had a principals conference for the Ohio district here. And I, I realized halfway through the week that I missed a Monday um, with Mapis. And, and so uh, <laughs> anyways, we're back on track uh, looking at these kingdom parables that show up in Matthew chapter 13. And um, this will end the, um, if, we, if we're following the lectionary as we've been kind of doing it, it kind of doubles our preparation time so that we're preparing for sermons and the Bible studies, but also uh, for this Bible study, we can take a little bit of what we've learned and look at it from a slightly different angle. So uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, 45, 46, those verses in particular give us a very um, uh, concise uh, set of two parables. Um, and then there's a third parable that comes in there uh, right after, but um, kind of Jesus conclusion of what did you say this morning? I think it was eight parables or seven parables in this well, chapter. It's uh, within the discourse itself that many scholars believe that there's seven. But you and I discussed that the little uh, there's another little one there too after the uh the, the parable. Well, if you call it a parable, the, the understanding of the old and new treasures. Yeah. About a man who takes so it, if you want to include that into that. It would be eight parables in this chapter, but would you include it into the discourse? That I don't know. I, I mean, there's different debates on that, but interesting question. Yep. Nope. That's that's good. So, anyways, to 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 conclude that, we'll be, we'll be talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, spoiler alert. That's uh that's uh the most valuable thing, or is it? We'll uh we'll kind of take a point <laughs> counterpoint on this. I think uh, we we're entering into this. Um. Well, maybe uh play out two different uh, interpretations of these parables and uh, we'll make our case for them um, all the while conceding that uh, I think we can agree that, that both would be appropriate biblical interpretations of these parables um, but there's there's different value in each of them so yeah 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 so I think I think that that'll get us into it so let's uh, let's go to Matthew 13 uh, verse 44 through 46 and I'll, I'll read it for us and you'll see these are very similar each other it almost sounds like jesus is repeating himself but um uh, so matthew 13 verse 44 the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it and so i, th I think that's gonna um keep us occupied for the next half hour here so so we'll uh what what do you what do you what do you think when you hear those what what's your what's your interpretation pastor mapis well when i just look at the plain literal sense of you know, the the what i'm just looking at it and what it's simply saying is this the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in a field and it's and it's it's like a merchant inserts a fine pearl but I think we can get hung up on it. It's not so much the merchant, but again, this kingdom of heaven is likened unto a pearl of great value. Uh, and that's how I initially, when I read this, that's what my my initial instincts and my training and all those things that I've been involved with, uh, that's what I see, that this kingdom of heaven is very, very valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, I, it's, I, I, and I think the other points you have, you know, the man, the man who finds a treasure of the hidden field, he sells all that he has, or you have the merchant who sells all that he has. Those are just kind of sub points to enhance the main truth that what Jesus is trying to say. That this is this, a priceless treasure. This is worth so more than everything. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. yeah. I yeah, think we I, both agree on that. 
Yeah, and, and and maybe just to to push a little bit further to define the kingdom of heaven, um, because I think that's an important point for your interpretation. Because because I think I could take my interpretation and say, yeah, the kingdom of heaven is that valuable. Um, but but maybe I take it maybe your place in the kingdom of heaven. So for you, the kingdom of heaven, would you say it's synonymous with the gospel, with the forgiveness of sins found uh, in Christ? Um, our, our our dogmaticians would always say that. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, Luke would say the kingdom of God, he's talking to a different audience. Uh, the kingdom of Theos, God in, the, in a more general sense. Uh, but Matthew more has a, probably much, a much larger Jewish audience, heaven. But I would say that our dogmaticians always say it's the reign and rule of Christ established in the hearts of believers. Mm -hmm. Working the Holy Spirit, working through the word of God. Yeah. That is the kingdom of heaven. So having this having this um um so i, I don't know you could almost say having or I, I'm, I'm hearing you say you could say it's having uh, being a part of god's family is is the kingdom of heaven that's how priceless it is yeah because we, if you're looking at the early parables of jesus in 13 it talks about uh, you know, the parable of the soul or what was what's what was sold in people's hearts mm -hmm. You know, it's been taken away. So this is, again, the kingdom of heaven established in the hearts of believers through the work of the Holy Spirit, working through that word of God. It's the yeah. rule. That's where Christ rules and reigns now. And if you want to know where believers live, you look for the marks of the church where the mm -hmm. word of God is preached and the sacraments are ministered according to Christ's institution. Yeah. So so in the uh, in the your interpretation, then for the the man who's. Uh, who finds a treasure and covers it up and then goes and buys it. Um, and then the, the merchant, who, who is that merchant? Who is that man? I don't, I don't think it really matters because okay. it's just, because it's just, he's just, Jesus just using those, uh, that instance of saying, Hey, to help support his idea that this, this kingdom is very valuable. I, I give an instance, uh, in our Bible study after, our, in our Bible study after our services on Sundays, I always let the people ask me, hey, any questions on my sermon? Um, I don't know if I remember I did this yesterday, but I was talking to somebody about this. It might have been then. But anyways, nonetheless, it would be like me telling someone, hey, my son's growing. He's growing really tall. He's growing as tall as that apple tree in the backyard. Now, what's the main point am I trying to say? My son is getting tall like that apple tree in my backyard. But I'm not assigning the leaves to to my son or the branches yeah. or okay. the bark. So I'm just making a point, one single point. And exegetically, Lutheran exegetes have always understood these parables. You make it always comes to one single point. Now there have been some church fathers in the past, like us and some others, who would like to interpret all these little single little points, yeah. like the man in the field or the merchant. And we have a lot of modern Lutherans who like to do that too. And it's an allegorical approach okay. to interpreting these parables. And there's nothing wrong with, I mean, it, it's tomato, tomato, but I side more on just sticking with, to the main, one main point, uh, because you could really go crazy with some of these. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to go know. a little crazy with it and, and maybe <laughs> okay. just to, because, and, and I appreciate, but it's good that we're having this conversation because I, I, um, what, what I understand of the, the more traditional approach, which I, I try to say this as kindly as possible, which is where I thought you were, um, but but I like the nuance that you have because I, I think it steps a little bit closer to the interpretation I have for this parable. But the, the traditional approach is you as an individual, you, Michael, are, are a man who finds the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. And you realize it's worth it more than anything else in your life. So you you place that as a priority in your life. And the same with the merchant. You you come across this this kingdom of heaven thing and and it becomes the most important thing in your life. So you give up everything for it. And so that and that that um that's how I that's how I learned it growing up. And that's I, I, I don't think that's wrong. And I, I like the way you're, yeah. you're talking about it too. So so it becomes yeah, yeah. Um, it's, this is well, how Chris, important God's kingdom is for an individual. Uh P.E. Kretzman. I love my Kretzman commentaries. You like you like him too. You we both read them. And uh, yeah, he's right there in the, this blurry section right here. <laughs> yeah, right <there. laughs> yeah. And he said he takes that approach too. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it because you'd have a Paul would say in Philippians that I, you know I I 
I have, you know, I have no problem losing everything that I have for and for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, not having our rights, my own righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And I think uh, that's OK. But when you when you want to but when you look at these parables outside of the first parable, there's some different subtype points that are made. All the rest of the points are these parables are making just one simple point. Mm -hmm. And I think the key is when you're looking at these, this parable and you stick to that one point, it's so valuable. Now you have to ask the big why question. Why is it so valuable? Right. Paul, or Paul says it in Philippians. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, and even in Hebrews, you know, in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 12 uh, for the joy set before him. He, he, he endured the cross rose from the dead now seated at the right hand of the father yeah you know, no that's it's, that's good and i i don't think we're as far away as we thought we were maybe because, not it, yeah it's because because i, cause, cause I <laughs> i'll just play my interpretation out then and and okay. i have a graphical uh aid uh for this you, you've probably seen this before Let's see is it coming up not blurry back it up just the fuzz there we go oh this i might yeah, have to turn good. off my blurry background for this one. Oh golly here we go Oh, there yeah, you go. So, hmm. yeah so this this is um ed riojas this is his uh, uh painting that he's done within the last decade or two and i'm not sure the date on it but anyways um shows the uh, uh the words for for the um what does it say for for joy he went and sold all that he had and bought that field and so it's kind of interpreting that verse 44 parable and it's showing Christ pulling a, a tomb out of the ground. And 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 um, I, I love that graphical depiction of it. And I think, it, what, what would your response be to that? I Because I kind of feel like what well, you were describing I, I, Yes, it, it is. It but the problem, the, the thing is, though, with with that interpretation, even though we're, we're kind of, we're dancing around each other, it's assigning the man to Jesus. Yeah, right. And, and, and that's, that's where, where I was going to say, I'll, I, I'll yeah. go a little bit crazy. I'll. I'll start to start to allegorize the parts of the parable, and um, and so the um, so the yeah, the man who f finds that that treasure, um, uh, which you are God's treasured possession, he finds you, and he gives up everything for you, and that's Christ shedding his blood, giving up his life on the cross, and and so yeah, I I I I think we have the same point, uh, the same main point, but then um, I add a little bit more interpretation to the parable for it, and um. For better or well, for worse, yeah. it's yeah. Because one of the things that I th th that uh, Doctor Gibbs, very great, great commentary on Matthew, the Concordia commentary and, and such, and Doctor David Scare too. Uh, I think he originally came up with, you know, was one of the ones who really started pushing this understanding. And, and you know, and you we talked earlier today too. I'm, I'm kind of like sixty forty. You know, yeah. I, as a Lutheran, I love the newer understanding, but I, I hold, I still hold to these old rigid. And I think good exegetical rules. Yeah. They help me keep kind of straight and narrow forward. But if you start assigning to Jesus being a man, the next thing you know, okay, the field in the previous parable, the field equals the world. And next thing you know, like with Dr. Gibbs, well, we have the doctrine of atonement right here, or doctrine, not only atonement, but a doctrine of election. Jesus buys the field so he can have you as the treasure, God's elect in the field. But Amen. there's one problem. Hey, Amen. But my the dogmatician in me it says, time out. We don't use parables or figures of speech for, to prove for doctrines. Yeah. Yes. And so this is where I, I I stop and you know and I shake the you know all the excitement off and everything else and just get back to simple catechetical <laughs> dogmatic rules of looking at the text and sticking with plain meanings of the text to establish doctrines of the faith. And, and so. Maybe I've taken a middle ground between these two things. Maybe that's yeah. what it is as we're talking. But the kingdom's value and what makes it so valuable. It's what, yesterday we had our prayer and preaching service and we did a catechism recitation on the Apostles' Creed. You have that wonderful second article. You know, he has bought and won me not with gold or silver. And I added pearls in there as I was preaching this. I mentioned it again in the sermon, but with his precious blood. Yeah. It's there is where the that's the value of this kingdom on this side of glory. Right. And, and and particularly because especially when you're looking at, you know, just going back into chapters 11, 
in our chapters 10, Jesus has talked about, I'm going to send you out into the world. And by the way, I'm going to cause divisions in your family, you know. Yeah. Aha, there you go. And then, then you have John the Baptist in prison. Hey, are you the one, Jesus? So these parables, especially these two, are have great significance for the disciples. Is it worth it? Yeah. And not yeah. only that, you read the very next chapter, chapter 14, we have the count of John the Baptist's death, his execution. So is this kingdom worth it? Yes. Why? Because of what Jesus did for you. Right. No, and, yeah. and that's great. Yeah, and that's, I, and I, th I think that's, that, that is a good conclusion to take away from this parable that, that the kingdom of heaven is, is worth everything. And, and so I, I think, yeah, there is a slight nuance because uh, for, for, for me, we, we become that thing that is given up everything for, which is a description of the kingdom, but it, but like you said, it kind of adds a couple more things. Maybe, maybe just to throw a little bit more into the argument, like I, I don't mind taking doctrine, seeing doctrine in parables when it's supported outside of scripture. Right. And and I think that's probably where where I I justify myself in taking this okay. maybe further allegorical interpretation is I'm not going outside of scripture to come up with new doctrines from this parable. We're just seeing other things from scripture in this parable that maybe not be the main point, maybe not be what Jesus was trying to get at. But um, so yeah, anyways, that's <laughs> but, here, but here's the thing is I found with just looking at different people and how they preach this. If you preach it classically the old way. That you are the man, you know, the, the are you willing for the sake of the gospel to renounce all things? Give everything up. Yeah. Give everything off. Why is that? Because Jesus died for you and did the same for you. There's a gospel application. You can flip this around. You know, this interpretation, G, you are this treasure. Jesus gave up all for you. So what's the application for us? Well, we love because he first loved us. And because oh. Jesus gave up himself, everything for us, we also are ready to give up everything everything for us too so no matter how you take this on both sides it'll work homiletically yeah right yeah and that and that's the beauty of um being a lutheran pastor is we we let scripture interpret scripture so we're not we're not just taking this and running whichever direction we feel like going that week with it we we are informed by the rest of the spirit's guided um revelation for us so that we can interpret within the the doctrines of the church, what we know right. to be true from scripture. And, and we could take great comfort from this word. And, and, and I think that's one of my favorite things about being Lutheran is, is that we have the justification is at the center of everything. Where is the forgiveness of sins found? And, and here you're saying it's in the value here. I'm seeing it in the parable itself that, you know, Christ gave up everything to forgive you, to, to rescue you. And, and whatever way you look at it, we, we always come back to where is Jesus at work for us? Um, in the in the text and and what does it tell us about Jesus work for us where does it deliver Jesus work for us and um yes yeah, so, so the treasure here is is uh could be the kingdom itself could be that you are the treasure of 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 God and and that's one one way I wanted this this conversation to go a little bit because I, I did a qu quick word study not an in-depth word study of the word treasure in the Bible and and it's interesting because um the the number of of uh, occurrences of the word treasure um, I don't have the exact count but majority of the occurrences of the word uh, treasure uh, deal with um, the word of God such as uh, where's Proverbs seven verse one I had my list here and of course my son keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you um, and uh, that 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 concept or, or the the treasure in jars of clay where's where's that at in second corinthians 4 verse 7 but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to god and not to us and so the treasure in jars of clay being this the 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 spirit within you the the work of god within you um so this word or work of god is the primary thing that scripture talks about as treasuring but then also on the uh, on the other side of it we have what was talked about in our Deuteronomy 7 reading yesterday we had in church that that you are my treasured possession or um, similar words in Exodus 19 verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession. And then Deuteronomy 14 verse 2 says you are a people holy to the Lord and your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. And um, is, is it Second Peter 2 verse 9? Um, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a 
people belonging to God for his own possession, kind of the concept of something that God treasures and values. So so I, I um, maybe just to kind of answer this question, what is valuable in Scripture? What is the most valuable thing? From our human perspective, it's God's word, his work for us, his word, which delivers his work for us. Um, it's it's the sacraments which bring that word to us that apply it to our lives. So from our human perspective, that's the treasure. From God's perspective, we poor, miserable creatures, for whatever reason, are the treasure. We we are God's treasure. Yeah, this is, and this he's is our treasure. I'm, yeah, yeah, this is where I'm going to. Theology is the art of making distinctions. I've heard that yeah, many times. Yeah, right, right. And, uh, and one of those, I'm going to make a distinction here. Um, you mentioned the Exodus 19.5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice. Now, this is a key word. Now, therefore, if you will in, indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession among all peoples for all mine. But we know historically, not too many chapters after this, the people of Israel made a golden calf. Yeah, right. And and throughout, and we can even see the golden, you know, we're no different than the Israelites. We have all kinds of golden calves that we make in our lives, too. We just don't fit this Exodus 5, if you shall indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. We don't. Right. We never have. And there's only one person. If you, if you really want to be, from my perspective, if you want to be consistent with the idea that Israel's reduced down to one. One man, Jesus, the yeah, yeah. Israelite. He is only the one who did this in Exodus 19.5. If you just put in there, Jesus, therefore, indeed obeyed his voice and kept the covenant. And Jesus is God's treasured possession. He's the only one who's ever done that. Jesus, priceless treasure. Yeah, but right. the, key yeah. is, the key here, too, though, is uh, but those who are in Christ. Who have been baptized into Christ, who have put on Christ. Now God sees them as a treasured possession. That's the route I take. That's the nuance between where I'm coming from and where you're coming from. Right. Uh, yeah. It, no. it, I think it, eventually we would probably get to the same point. We would say the same things, but we're just taking a little bit nuanced track with it. With right. A couple yeah, Bible and, verses. yeah. And I definitely don't disagree with what you're saying there that we we, we certainly cannot keep it. But um, I was just looking to see what the Greek word in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, yeah. and it's not my favorite, one of my favorite Greek words, tereo, where where you keep something as a treasure, um, which is often the word that shows up like in Matthew 28 um, in the Great Commission, um, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. That word obey is the same word as keep in the New International Version that I grew up learning. And, and so that that keep word can actually also be to treasure, to hold on to. So, mm -hmm. so obey or keep equals treasure. And, and so when we keep God's word, um, we treasure God's word. And, and I always like to point out, because um, what you're saying is very true, that we, we fail to, to keep God's word, to hold on to God's word. And, and that might lead us to despair if, if we say, well, look, it says a very clear if then statement. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession. And we can inventory our life and say we we haven't obeyed God's voice. We haven't kept his covenant at all times. So we must not be his treasured possession. But if you realize that that obedience or that keeping word is also treasuring, if you hold to that word and you desire that word, which is the spirit's work within you, um, and, and you realize Oh crud! I am not doing what I'm supposed to do. That's still treasuring God's word because you desire to aspire to that God, that word of God as the Spirit moves you. Um, and yeah. so that's when we we seek forgiveness. That's again the Spirit's work. He drives us to realize we're falling short and we uh, we're lacking something that Jesus has to give, which is the treasure, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I understand your under possession of it. I'm just <laughs> trying. I'm I am a creature of consistency. Yeah, uh, you're you're. But, yeah. I'm the opposite. I'm very, <laughs> <Right>. very, <laughs> and and so I, I I try to stay consistent throughout that with with the scriptures of understanding, um, because we don't come into this world as a treasure, right? We come we come into this world as a weed, and we have to now, be made. Now weed. you're just mixing our parables, yeah, <laughs> now, yeah, right. not mixing them, but going along with the whole theme of the, these parables in thir Matthew yeah. thirteen. But we come in this world as weeds. We had to be made weed. 
and we're made we to, in the in the righteousness of Christ, covered in Him. Yeah. And, and so I, I uh, so it, it's it, and everything about Christ Himself. You know, it, well, I talk about the volume of the book. It's written to me. It's written yeah. about me. You know, it's about what He came to do. It's not if there's anything about us, it's always bad. Right. Uh, so I, I guess, yeah, I, I mean, I can only go so far with this where we're at right now, but that that's why I take the track way, where, why I do. Yeah. And I, I could well, go on some other things too, going back into chapter 12 and are those who have eyes to see and hear and ears to understand, you know, understanding with your heart. Um, what do you understand? Right. Do you, do you understand with the heart, the value of this kingdom? And, yeah. and, and once you understand the value of it, which is Christ shed blood, what he's done for us, then we could, honestly, with, with St. Paul, stand and say, I can give up all things. But we have to start with the value first. And it's not with me. Right. It's with Christ. Yeah. Well, uh, to continue our contentious uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talk here, anyway. you said we we don't come into this world as treasures, and I, I definitely agree with that because there's nothing good about us. No one's righteous, not even one. But I but I I I, I like to think of God as um, maybe this is um, a poor parable or poor uh, analogy for God, but God's like the person who walks through an antique store and he sees that thing on the wall that everybody's walked past for years because they think it's worthless, and he says. Nope, that's got value. And, and he takes it home and he cleans it up. And, and all of a sudden it's this beautiful thing that everybody wants. That that I think God sees uh, his created goodness in each of us, even though that goodness has been marred by sin. He He treasures us because he knows what we can be, what he uh, can make us to yeah, be. I, I would have really yeah, disagreed on that one. I Because I, when I look at the cross of Christ, I see law and gospel and its pristine simplicity. But then why did why did Christ why did God send His Son for God? Well, because so loved just look at the, the very world. Quick. Yes, and and God so loved the world, gave His only begotten Son, and whoever should not believe, you should believe that should have eternal life. But yeah. whoever does not shall face His eternal wrath. And that's where I'm getting to with the cross. Where at the cross you see Jesus, you see the cross, you see long gospel in its in its uh, beautiful simplicity. At the cross, you see God's wrath on sinners. Right. God yeah. hates sin. He hates the sinner. And it's a paradoxical statement. God hates the sinner. He sees it by showing his wrath on Jesus. But yeah. at the same time, he also loves the sinner. So it's a thing of, so I don't see when Jesus, when, when God walks into an antique store, you know, we're just nothing, but he's going he's gonna to burn it down because that's what we deserve. Yeah. But in covered in Christ, that's our value. But why did he send Christ if he wanted, if he was just going to burn it down? That that's what I see is that he was willing. Well, because he's going to for those who reject, son. he will burn it. He will, but he will burn it down. Yeah. In time, he will for those who reject what he's done for the whole world. But but that's the that's the thing too is he desires everyone to be saved, so he sees yes. the treasurability. He sees that. Yes, he does. The, that in everybody and well um, he doesn't that, see that and this is where i disagree with again i don't think he does not see a treasure anything in us but in christ he does yeah i don't know maybe we're maybe we've come to a a, a standstill in our disagreement here because because <laughs> right. I, I think it's that that love of god for people that that motivates him to send his son jesus his his heart that hurts for what people would have the wrath that would come towards them if he would, did not intervene or, or act on his behalf. And and for, for me, that's an important concept about God because it helps me to see in others that this is someone who God loves and and without Christ, um, they would receive the wrath of God. And so my heart yeah. should be for them to make yeah. sure they have that, which Christ but, has done for them. But this is where too, I, again, the theologies are making distinctions in one sense. God displays his love for people in the crucifixion of his son, mm -hmm. not by anything he sees in us or feels yeah. for us. It, it's done in the person and work of his son. And then yeah. now that love goes out from the cross. That's just, you know, and maybe I'm being too dogmatic about it. Maybe that yeah. could be, 
you know, and you're coming about it from more of an exegetical understanding, maybe. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where I, I when I, I kind of hold to the idea of total depravity of our original sin, original corruption is complete corruption. Right. Yeah, there's and nothing I, good. Yeah, you know, the image of God is gone. Right. It's completely lost. And so when I hear like and I, I see where you're getting at with the idea of God's love. But if God walks into an antique store, he sees these old antiques, us, he sees some little good. Are we really that corrupt then? Yeah. Is there some and, image of God left or is there not? And that's where I, I maybe I'm being over dogmatic, but I'm going to stick with it. There's nothing good. The image of God is completely lost and it has to be restored in Christ alone, we have nothing, zero. But yeah. being covered in Christ, now God can truly love us because he gave his son for us. And now we have the, his image now restored as a de declaration of forensic justification. Even though we look in the mirror, we don't see it. God now sees us that way. Yeah. No, and yeah, yeah maybe, so, maybe we're too far into the weeds and just uh, <laughs> right, yeah. anyway. shooting past each other at the same direction. But but yeah, it's, yeah. I, don't hear me as saying there is some spark of good within us that we're holding on to that God sees. I I, yeah. I I just like to talk about it as He knows what He created us to be. He knows what He desires us to be. He knows He can make us to be that. And, and so that's that's where His love for us comes, and and His desire that that no one would uh, miss out on it. Well, and I think that's, and this is where maybe another nuance, but that love is displayed in sending his son mm -hmm. because we are so corrupt. There's nothing else that he could do for his creation except send his son. Right. To shed blood. Because remember, and, and this is something I learned in, in dogmatics too, that, the, the, you know, we're always putting it on us, you know, but there's also another game being played. It's between God and Satan that was done in the Garden of Eden. You know, because if God is just and holy and right, you know, the soul that sins shall surely die. You know, the day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die, he said in, in Genesis chapter 2. Well, right. that happened. He had to hold to his word. And now the only way, and the shedding of blood is the only way now to restore back creation and the restoration of the new heaven and new earth would be through the shedding of blood. And yeah. God would have to do that himself. Yeah. That's the value of the kingdom. Right. No, and it, and it, that's know. that's the treasure. Yeah. So that's that's the, <laughs> so, the priceless, priceless treasure. Jesus, priceless treasure. That yeah. was our that was our sermon him for yesterday. Yeah, and 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 then so maybe to um, make you comfortable with my terminology of God's view of us as His treasure yeah. is because and and you've said this because of Christ we are now treasure and that's that's more yeah. in line with what the Deuteronomy fourteen passage that I quoted earlier says. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. How are you holy? Well, it's because of Jesus. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. And so because yeah. of Christ, you are his treasured possession. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, for, for us, we from agree our human on perspective. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> well, I was just thinking as we're as we're kind of sparring more than we usually do in this, it's it's fitting. This is uh convention week going on in uh, Milwaukee, the right. LCMS convention. It, it, and, yeah, the, the the spirit of uh debates in the air, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, the contentiousness <laughs> is is evident among our Senate. And I, I pray with us and pray pray with me that the uh that the the work that we're called to do is is um is what predominates. And uh, I love the theme that we have for our convention this year is uh, Christ crucified. And right. um, if you um, are looking for something else to watch besides us talking heads, you can uh, go watch President Harrison's opening sermon for the uh, convention. And yeah. uh, in the opening worship service, his sermon was just very powerful. He, he just talked about, uh, I think he had a refrain at one point in his sermon. He said, hold to the Bible and Christ crucified. Hold to the Bible and Christ crucified. The Bible and Christ crucified, and that—that's—that's that's what we're about. That—that that is our treasure, and and yes. I, I think we um we do very well as a church um, body and as individual congregations to remember that's what we're about. This treasure that we have in jars of clay, whether it's our human uh, individual uh, awareness and witness that we bring to the world, or the 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 buildings, structures, organizations that we get to bring this treasure to the world with. It's, it's that treasure that makes all the difference. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, prayers for our, our convention that go that goes on. I think they're done in what Tuesday, I believe. Yeah, Tuesday or Wednesday. Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. So there's a lot of work yet ahead this week, and uh, pray it all goes well and God's will is done there. Yeah, uh, according to His Word, uh, and that's uh, yeah. Despite all the debates that are going to happen on the floor, that uh, at the end of the day, that it works out for the for God and His kingdom, right? Yeah, the furtherance of the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, it, it's it's something I I um I don't like to watch too closely, but find myself being drawn in. And it's interesting to see the things that go back and forth, and um, uh, see the conclusions of uh, the motions that are coming, and see what kind of focuses our our synod has. Our, our synod's an interesting thing because it it doesn't it, it um and President Harrison pointed this out at one point in the convention uh, proceedings that I happened to be watching. He said that. The synod doesn't cannot direct congregations what to do. It can only encourage congregations in certain ways. And so uh, we we walk together and we come together to be encouraged to do different works by the synod. Right. And and we agree on these things that are important. That's the key too. We 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 walk we we agree to walk together in doctrine and in, doctrine and practice. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, and that's the thing. It's important. If you, it's an agreement. It's a handshake type of agreement. You know, we all come together and, and but the key is that doctrine and practice, that's the treasure that we possess as a synod. Yeah. Word and sacrament. I mean, uh, that's what we, you know, so really to have to walk together, we have to agree what that treasure is. Right. And how it's supposed to be practiced and distributed amongst and how we show forth to that amongst the nations and to our own people. And yeah, for sure, that's where true unity is found. You know, it was, where is it when uh, it talks about the passage and escape? I just had it in my head and it escapes me about the blessed, blessed is the brother who walks in true unity. It's like oil being dripped off a man's Psalm 133. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is a true thing. It's a nice when we have brothers and sisters in Christ who walk in that unity uh, of understanding the word of God, the full counsel of God. But also, even more in a narrow sense, the gospel, the sacraments, you know, because it shows the true marks of the church, where the mm -hmm. where the God is preached and taught, the sacraments are ministered according to Christ's institution. Yep. And, and uh, when you have that, then the that's what makes the sin, in, in some sense, a treasure as well, because yep. of what we in the congregations, because of what we possess. Yeah, definitely. No, that's I'd be a good spot to stop. I'll I'll throw a couple links to uh, President Harrison's sermon and also another treasure that's coming out of this uh, convention. They added something new to the daily business, and that's a a catechism focus. And uh, so Peter Bender, one of the great teachers of our day in in our church body, uh, uh, gave a great introduction yesterday to um, a great introduction to the catechism, why it's important and and why it should be used. And so I'll, I'll throw those links in here. Um, like I said, if you want to watch something more than just our talking heads, it's <laughs> some good stuff. Uh, might yes, find some is. more treasure in that than our, our little uh, <laughs> back and forth here. But our um, feeble attempts of, yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah, let's let's call it there. And uh, thank you guys for, for being a part of this um, kind of a obscure question. And um, I am going to call this, what does the Bible say about treasure? Um, and um, if you were watching this to look for a secret treasure map or anything, I apologize. That's not what we were about here. But well, yeah. if we've heard uh, what the true treasure is, and that's all Christ has done for you and, and delivers to you through his word and his sacraments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. All right. We'll, yep. we'll see you when we see you. All right. Take care.